Hi, you're here because your child's been diagnosed with hydrocephalus. And today we're gonna to give you a presentation on hydrocephalus and its processes. I'm Tracy, I'm your first presenter, and then Tanya, Anna, and Gary will be joining us. Hi, my name's Tanya, and I'm going to be talking about congenital hydrocephalus, also known as water on the brain. And what it is, it's an overproduction of cerebrospinal fluid inside the brain inside these ventricles right here. There's four ventricles and they get enlarged by extra cerebrospinal fluid. And it's caused by either an overproduction of the fluid or, it's, or it can be caused by a blockage or even when cerebrospinal fluid does not absorb into the bloodstream. And what happens if your infant has hydrocephalus is it causes an enlarged head. And as you can see, this infant here um, has an enlarged head and what happens is the bones in the in the head they separate because of so much pressure has built up so here we have a normal brain normal ventricles with the normal flow of cerebrospinal fluid and this photo here shows there's a blockage and it's causing the cerebral spinal fluid to um, back up inside the ventricles and that's what causes the enlarged head. Okay, I think. Okay, so to test your knowledge, question one is, how would you define hydrocephalus in your own words? Yes, you? I would define hydrocephalus as an accumulation of CSF in the brain due to a blockage, malabsorption, or excess production of CSF. Great, yes, good job. All right, so what is cerebrospinal fluid? And what does it do? Well, here you have a picture of the brain, and then this light blue is, is the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. And what it does is it protects the brain, it nourishes the brain, and it even removes waste products. Okay, so I'm going to show you why cerebrospinal fluid is important. Okay, so here's a little experiment. So here I have an egg in a, a small dish of water. The egg represents the brain. The water represents the cerebral spinal fluid. Here I have an egg with no cerebral spinal fluid. It's just the brain, okay? And so the cerebral spinal fluid, it protects the brain from injury. And so when, say, uh, the brain gets, your head gets shaken up, okay? You can see the brain is okay inside the cerebral spinal fluid. It's protecting the brain from hitting the sides of the skull. But when you have a brain that doesn't have the right amount of cerebral spinal fluid, in this case, there's none. And so again, there's no cerebral spinal fluid. The container represents the head, the egg represents the brain, and there's no cerebral spinal fluid. So when the head gets shaken around, oh, this is what happens. With no cerebral spinal fluid, it damages the brain. Okay? And so this is why cerebral spinal fluid is so important. And uh, I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. So question two to test your knowledge is, what is one important function of cerebrospinal fluid? How about you? It protects the brain. Good, yes it does. Hi, my name is Gary and I'm gonna be talking about the causes of congenital hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a result of various genetic conditions, infections, and injuries. So Hydrocephalus um, is a cause of these conditions because these conditions will cause a blockage of CSF, excess production of CSF, and malabsorption of CSF into the blood. So you have two types. You have genetic inherited causes and acquired causes. The common genetic inherited causes include aqueductal stenosis, Dandy Walker syndrome, and myelodysplasia, which is also known as spina bifida. Acquired causes include hemorrhage, which is trauma, infection, tumor, and meningitis. Okay, so the clinical manifestations for hydrocephalus include early and late manifestations. The early manifestations 
often include rapid head growth, poor feeding, and distending scalp veins. The late manifestations often include projectile vomiting, decreased heart rate, and high-pitched cry. The most common symptoms and clinical manifestations you'll see are high-pitched cries, macrocephaly, bulging fontanelles, irritability, and sunset eyes. Okay, and now we're going to talk about how it's diagnosed. During pregnancy, it can sometimes be seen on the ultrasound in your second trimester. And if that does occur, then they'll do an amniocentesis to confirm it. And what an amniocentesis is, is it shows here that um, it's a procedure where they use ultrasound and then also a needle that punctures through the skin and the amniotic sac, and then they aspirate some of the fluid for testing. Another way it's diagnosed after the baby is born is if the baby shows signs of bulging fontanelles, so they'll usually do an ultrasound to observe the internal structures of the brain, um, and then they will also do an MRI or a CAT scan to also confirm and determine the, the process of it. And here are some examples of an MRI. On this side here, you'll see that the ventricles are filled with excess fluid, and that's why they're bulging in black. And here you'll see this is a brain that does not have the bulging ventricles that are filled with fluid. And that's the normal looking. And this one here is an ultrasound through the fontanelle, the anterior fontanelle of the baby's head. And it also shows the bulging, bulging ventricles here. And then this is actually down lower and it's the bottom part of the ventricle. And you can see that it also has fluid here and here. I'm now gonna discuss the treatment options for hydrocephalus. So the treatment for hydrocephalus is dependent upon the cause and severity of the hydrocephalus. So there's two primary treatments. For less severe hydrocephalus, you will have a simple draining of excess CSF. And for more severe cases, you'll have the placement of a surgical shunt. So a surgical shunt is a tube placed that inserts on the head and it travels down to the abdomen to drain excess CSF. This shunt is equipped with a valve. So this valve will sense any increases in pressure in the brain and ventricles of CSF. And in response, it will open the tubes to allow shunting of the CSF down to the abdomen where it will be absorbed. So a major thing to note with patients who have shunts placed is the need to keep away magnets. Having a magnet nearby or um, in the proximity of an infant with a shunt placed can result in um, obstruction of the shunt by having it moved from its original position. When it comes to treatment complications for hydrocephalus, there are two primary complications. One is infection and the second is mechanical malfunctions. So infection affects about 10% of all patients and this is evidenced by symptoms such as fever, vomiting, decreased responsiveness, and seizure. Mechanical malfunctions are often caused by obstructions to shunts and obstructions of the shunt result in increased intracranial pressure. So this will be noted by uh, bulging of the anterior fontanelles or pupillary dilation. Review questions number four. What are some of the treatment options for hydrocephalus and are worse, what are some possible complications? Would anyone like to answer? Go ahead. So um, the treatment options, you said draining the extra fluid or um, getting a shunt placed and then for complications is infection or an obstruction of the shunt? Yes, that is correct. Good job. Okay, so hello, my name is Anna and I'm going to be talking about discharge care teaching. So there's some important facts to know before you leave the hospital. And the first one, if your child gets a shunt, you should be able to monitor that and recognize for signs and symptoms of infection and obstruction. And with an obstruction, you have to recognize the signs of increased fluid in the brain. And if you do have one, you want to make sure to call 911 and bring your child in. So, and this includes fever, being less alert, vomiting, seizures, high pitched cry, and having a setting sun sign, which is this picture. So you'll, their eyes will kind of point downwards and you'll be able to see the white in their sclera. Also, as they begin to grow, you want to monitor their developmental milestones and make sure to make notes in order to speak with their pediatricians about it. And most importantly, you want to be able to take care of yourself so you can take care of them. And you want to build a support network, rest, exercise, and have a healthy diet. Okay, so for the prognosis of your child, it all depends on the severity of the hydrocephalus. But many children will have intellectual disabilities and learning disorders, and this can be with memory, processing, and visual, spatial issues. They might have any motor disabilities, um, and social and behavioral, and epilepsy. But children can live a normal and healthy life 
um, with the exception of contact sports. Go. So now we're just going to do a hydrocephalus document questionnaire to test your knowledge and see um, where you're at right now. So if you want to click on the link. So first, you can fill out your name. And then, what is hydrocephalus? Abnormal amount of CSF or abnormal amount of red blood cells? Uh, what is an important function of CSF? You can write in a short answer. Uh, what are some treatment options of hydrocephalus? So draining excess fluid or shunt, ventricular peritoneosha, or both. And what is not one of the clinical manifestations of hydrocephalus? So increased head circumference, vomiting, increased eating, and a high-pitched crying. And last question, what must you keep away from a ventricular peritoneal shunt? So is it shampoo, zinc, or magnets? So now that we've gone over the procedure, um, are you both in agreement to go ahead with the shunting procedure? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think so. Are there any questions or concerns regarding the procedure? Yeah, um, are there anything, complications or anything that can go along with it? Yeah, there are three complications that are very common. So you can have infection, mechanical malfunctions, or obstructions of the shunt. So are you familiar with identifying the signs of infection? No. So what you can do at home is you can assess Emily by taking your temperature and looking for a fever. If Emily is vomiting, if there is um, drainage at the incis incision site, or if there's decreased responsiveness, you wanna contact the healthcare provider right away so that she can get the attention she needs. For mechanical malfunctions, there's not much that you can do, but what you want to do is you want to schedule regular appointments with your primary care provider so that they can reassess her condition and her shunt to make sure that nothing's going wrong and that the intracranial pressure is being dealt with. Um, do you have any other questions? Um, yeah, uh, so after she has the procedure, um, how do we take care of her at home? Or what should I know about like home care? So what you want to know is that um, obstructions of a shunt can be common. So if the shunt is um, compromised, there'll be increased intracranial pressure, so her CSF will be building up. What you wanna do is, the babies have an anterior fontanelle which will bulge. So you wanna assess for bulging of the anterior fontanelle. In addition from that, for that, to ensure that the shunt stays um, working properly, you wanna make sure you keep her away from magnets because magnets will affect the placement of the shunt and will cause it to get dislocated from its original position. And you want to ensure that Emily stays out of any contact sports or um, excessive movement. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Do you have any further questions? Um, no. I don't think so. Okay.